Pierre. Uh, I was just wondering to what extent, because it, the, a lot of the words and, and things we've been talking about over the past while uh, are very linked in with the, um, uh, the Global Alliance for um, Genomics and Health. Uh, a, lot, a lot of the issues are uh, very much uh, the same, uh, and, you know, Jeff was asking me what lines of collaboration could be um, more formalized uh, or whatever between the U.S. and Canada. Uh, we have uh, just uh, launched a, uh, a new project, uh, it's not a very big one, it's about one and a half million, actually it's more than that, it's about three million dollars, uh, to try and get our act together in Canada in terms of data sharing across institutions, across jurisdictions, because we have issues uh, in, in terms of what we're doing in Canada, our, our, the accessibility to uh, clinicians or researchers in different jurisdictions and juris different institutions. And we have to get our act together in order to be credible partners for the Global Alliance. Um, but I'm just wondering if, uh, to what degree we could, and I heard Mike Brudno's name mentioned several times, and, and uh, he's very much involved in this new project, which actually will be, actually will be driven by uh, Bartha Knoppers, who is also uh, very much involved in the Global Alliance, and who many of you know. So I'm just wondering um, to what extent these things uh, could be aligned uh, and to what extent eMERGE is already very much linked in to the Global Alliance? I, I guess I can take a short version of that. It's an easy answer. We're not especially aligned at this point. Um, that's not to say that we shouldn't be, and I think it is something that I hope will be on the agenda going forward. You know, one of the things we that worries me a little bit about, uh, I think, the work of uh, the Global Alliance is, is, is great, but it sort of emphasizes Chris's point, yet is it yet another standard, and how do we make sure that we're getting, you know, the ones that we have aligned and make sure we use the best parts of each one and not just say, oh, that one doesn't work, so we're going to start all over again and create a new one. So I think that'll be an important... Uh, so I, th I think that's a great comment, and we have certainly been... Uh, uh, trying to influence the, the Global Alliance to, you know, not reinvent the wheel and look and see what's av available out there. I'm hoping that people like Mike Brudno are, are uh, sufficiently aware of what you're doing, what other countries are doing, uh, because uh, I think they're going to be very much involved in the, the words, you know, interoperability, APIs, and all of this kind of thing. I think they're going to be very involved in, in doing the uh, the, the detailed stuff on that. So, any way we can collectively make sure that there's not too much reinvention of the wheel, I think would be really good. Mark. Thank you. Uh, I thought Chris was going to tell the joke about it. The, the group gets together and says there are 18 standards. If we need to harmonize them, then we have 19 standards. But uh, so I think it's a very, <laughs> it's a variation on the same theme. Um, two um, uh, comments. Uh, First is related to training. Uh, I just wanted uh, the group to be aware that um, there are some discussions that are occurring between the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics and the American Medical Informatics Association relating to uh, the Clinical Informatics Fellowship Program, uh, which is accredited through um, uh, preventive medicine, to develop a genomic emphasis for those clinical informaticists that are interested uh, in developing genomics. And, so, and we're in the process now beginning to think about what would a curriculum uh, want to look like. So I think this would be an important group to engage in that sort of curricular uh, development and uh, perhaps also then aligning with the NLM training programs to say, okay, can we harmonize across all these different groups? The other thing is that Amy is also then looking at a non-physician-based fellowship training program that would sort of be the equivalent for PhD or other informaticists that could also get training there. So I think there's a real nice opportunity at a very low investment of time and effort uh, uh, to accomplish some things uh, in this space. And I'm sort of acting as a go-between, so anybody that's interested, just let me know. The second thing is you mentioned Genome Connect, and I'm glad you did, because um, that's also, Genome Connect has been involved in the ClinGen project. 
And uh, in addition, um, in PCORI, um, the, uh, one of the PCORnet patient-powered research networks is using Genome Connect uh, to to collect data, and one of the things that's really interesting as we talk about engaging patients more in terms of data collection and supplying the phenotype data that is difficult to get out of the healthcare system uh, is that uh, there's a lot of ability to create new forms and templates, and patients seem to be very interested uh, and willing to take the time and effort and they're pretty uh, to much fill that. And they're pretty much experts about their conditions. They, they are experts uh, right. about their conditions, um, uh, and, and certainly there's been plenty of examples uh, where these types of patient-powered networks uh, have really been uh, able to discover things that had previously not been noticed. So it is an innovative area. It's one um, where I think that uh, there's some real opportunities that are worthy of study. Uh, uh, and again, not to necessarily promote one platform, but it is a platform that's beginning to appear in a number of different spaces. Uh, and so uh, trying to not, again, you know, have 50 different ways to do this, but having at least some standards around what's being collected and how it ties into things like uh, HPO and that would be, uh, would be good. There's, yeah. just, just a second. So Adam and then uh, Mike and then Howard. Great. Uh, thanks, Rex. It's been a hard, little hard to get recognized back here in the back seats. <laughs> I will. So, I just wanted to uh, comment a little bit on what Chris was talking about, what Pierre was talking about. So, uh, it's been commented before the IOM's uh, Digitized Action Collaborative. This is the Genomics Roundtable's EHR work, uh, where we're actually representing genetic information in the electronic health record. We've been building this specifically off of the HL7 standards. We're building this off of 251. Um, we would be going towards FIRE, but FIRE isn't going to do that for meaningful use right now, but we're looking at that as a future iteration for it. Uh, the way we've been operating, though, is by trying to make sure that we can actually engage with all of these groups, and we actually have liaisons to almost every NHGRI program we've talked about today, as well as Global Alliance. And in fact, actually, after the Global Alliance meeting in Leiden, uh, we're going to start up uh, quarterly conference calls to make sure that we are aligning our work and coordinating our work together to make sure that we are progressing. Uh, we're also working with LOINC. We're, we're using standard, standard LOINC terminology to build our LOINC codes for this. And the end result is that we've already gotten, we've gotten agreements from Epic, Cerner, Meditech, Allscripts, and Athena Health to actually build these and develop pilots, uh, at least based on two pharmacogenomics use cases, which are our first iterations. So, you know, we are looking at making sure that we're using existing standards. We're not trying to build that 20th standard. Um, we're trying to use one through eight, through one through 19, I guess, and whatever is available. But it is something that we, we've been cognizant of. Oh, Rex, you were talking about the, the standard of, uh, of standardizing across uh, different EHRs and using a 95% certainty of caseness. And you know, I just and in thinking about that, as, as we're as we're evolving the standard, involving the field, that 95% certainty in some instances might um, specificity might capture 90% of all the cases, in other cases it might capture 10% of all the cases, and, I, I, and it's a logical starting point. But um, as Chris said, there's lots of room to store lots of extra bytes of data. I, mean, I think Cisco now measures data circling the globe in zettabytes, which is a billion gigabytes. Um, but um, if we stored the actual probabilities, if they came across, um, then you can actually do sensitivity analysis for more extreme caseness, or, you can, or maybe you don't necessarily throw away all the data of people that are in intermediate caseness. So I, I think that there's potential ways to, th to think about setting the standards that will allow mapping across the HRs that might be a, a, a little bit different, antithetical to our clini clinician view of the world, which is you either have it or you don't, but from that 10,000 foot vantage point of mining, of being da the data janitors that we are, we, we, we do assign probabilities and maybe we can use some of that data. And then I have just a, a brief um, follow-up comment to what you, you were saying about, uh, you, you triggered um, a, a question, is it when does a, when does a phenotype become actionable? Um, we've just curated something novel, and we now know something, and we've associated it, so let's say we associate it with mortality. I mean, we're stepping very gingerly in MVP toward, you know, reporting to clinicians or to par participants, and we've actually told them that the rule is that in the research realm, we won't be doing that. But you could certainly conceive of us coming up with a uh, predictor 
no, it's not, uh, just like some of the gen genetic ones, or maybe even much stronger, where we identify something novel about a patient from a metabolomic profile or from a curation of the phenomic data that is just as valuable clinically to a particular patient or, or his doctor. Um, but I don't, I don't know that we've ever had that dialogue about, is, are we generating actionable information on that side of the equation? Let me just quickly say that one of the ways that I think we've started to think about that in eMERGE is th through um, looking at what we're calling FIWAS, so looking at across phenotype space, and so looking for co-associations there. But I think it's a really ripe area for a potential research project. Of course, FIWAS has done it at an ICD level, but don't, don't get me started. Um, <laughs> The, uh, you bring up really a deep philosophical point, and that is what is the boundary between a disease state and a phenotype? Uh, I mean, at some level, uh, certainly Mendelian diseases, you know, a single change constitutes a, a disease by definition. Uh, and to what extent is abnormality from uh, the norm, whatever that means, uh, which is what we're talking about when we're talking about phenotyping, characteristics that are not common. Uh, which is why they're recognized as explicit phenotypes. And to what extent do they constitute a disease situation? Um, it really gets in, into very deep issues of philosophy of disease uh, or, or how we characterize disease. I, the reason I fuss about that is because of my ICD-11 role. Uh, but I, I think as we think about genomic association, uh, particularly disease uh, gene association, it begs a more crisp definition of what we really mean by a pathological entity that we deign to call disease, or, or at least uh, have sufficient um, uh, pathological effect that it would become an actionable circumstance, or at least a desirably actionable circumstance. Uh, and those sort of by their nature are really phenotypes. And so we get very circular in this whole notion of whether phenotypes predict, you know, common diseases, okay, that's fine. Uh, but phenotypes in and of themselves uh, raise significant boundary issues over what, what disease is. In the pharmacogenomic space, you know, we've been ta talking a lot about the fact that it's phenotypes that in most cases is what we're really interested in, that, you know, it's that metabolizer status or it's that receptor status, the phenotype uh, that derives from the genotype that it really drives the decision about how you alter uh, medication use or dose or whatever. Um, and it raises an interesting question, which is, uh, is, it, is genotype the way to answer these questions the best way? Uh, TPMT is a great example that Mary has studied, you know, for years. If you could measure the enzyme activity easily and cheaply, wouldn't that be better than deriving the um, metabolizer status from the genotype? Um, and um, so I, I think that we have areas where we're be already beginning to explore the role of the phenotype as opposed to the inference of the phenotype from a genotype. Well, we heard about intermediate uh, biochemical phenotypes earlier today as well. So just, you know, I, I think that that's, you know, a very good point that, you know, you, this sort of, that we're, we're developing new concepts of disease, but also, I mean, there, we're, we're defining old parameters in new ways. I mean, I, just as an example, a slope, a, a single value of a slope of a of urine protein progression over, because you have now the opportunity that never before to look at 100 values of someone over their 10-year life expectancy might have more predictive value than the way the clinician is using it today. Especially as, with the APOL1 genotype. Yeah. So, so, so now, is that, is that, is that, is that information that we should, we should also be reporting back to the patient and his clinician. And if you're, if you're having that debate about actionable variants, then, then we, that, we have to begin to have the, I, perhaps we have to begin to have that same debate about new actionable phenotypic parameters. It doesn't have to be either or, right? I mean, it's just a, it's just a reminder that we shouldn't build our EHR and our standardized terms that are so specific to genotype that there isn't room to build the same kind of logic into something that's phenotype. So what we do is both phenotype and genotype for a really important gene like TPMT where patients, you know, health status is at risk. Um, 
but uh, I wanted to follow up on, on one of your points, Rex, around uh, the storing of the data. So I think it makes a lot of sense, obviously, not to have the whole genome uh, sitting inside the EHR. But it did beg the question for me, um, as we were talking about in our panel three, with reanalysis of data. So how do you see that working in, in relating to the EHR? Yeah, I think, you know, it, it gets back to this question that I can't remember who was, who was that was talking about it earlier, but it's at what point is it more valuable to redo the test with maybe more sensitivity or with a better approach than it is to store raw data? And that was a topic that came up, you know, a bit earlier. You know, obviously, I think what we're imagining in the ancillary genomic system is to store raw data and then process that into a VCF file that can then be matched against whatever knowledge system we have. But, you know, at some point, the question is, which is cheaper, storage or re uh, for the, the original files, BAM files, for example, or to just uh, redo the sequence? And I think that's an economic decision. Storage is almost free. That's, that, that's not what our institution tells us. Uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think that's necessarily true that storage is almost free over, over here, Chris. Other, <laughs> other end. <laughs> so, um, because the, the storage depends on whether it's archival storage or whether you want that storage to be close to compute so that you can actually re, reanalyze. And uh, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna be able to do this reanalysis, especially from first principles, from the raw data, You've got to have all those data close to the compute, and that is not inexpensive. In fact, that's very expensive, um, depending on the volume of data. And so I'm not sure that, I, that we have good systems in place for shifting data um, agilely from cold storage into these hot zones for analysis. And I think that's one of the areas that, that we really need to think about. Because going back to the, the issues earlier today about analyzing variants, well, calling variants is still uh, an evolving art, right? So aligning, the basic process of aligning sequences to a genome is still evolving, and that technology is going to change. And so I think there is going to be uh, a lot of really interesting reanalysis science that we're going to be able to do if we've got the data stored in the proper way and we can get it to the compute um, seamlessly. Yeah, I was just going to uh, comment on the phenotype question that, you know, you can think about this as in the phenotype as genotype environment interaction, and you can think about the EHR um, um, managing that as well. Yeah, so just uh, in the same uh, theme, uh, so clearly uh, we have this opportunity for the first time to examine the phenome whether we call it deep phenotyping. Up until now, we've been incredibly constrained with simplistic phenotypes, uh, often just binary phenotypes. Uh, and we've got marvelous depth of genome sequence data or GWAS data. And suddenly now there's the opportunity for just about the entire portfolio to flip over into rich deep phenotype data at very little incremental cost. So I think that this is one of the most uh, exciting developments uh, that's coming up in the next couple of years is to catch up on the phenome. And I would very much like to see it be interoperable and not be offline, because that, as, as you have mentioned, enables dynamic uh, mining of data, because I don't think it's going to be static. We'd really like to do a best effort to have it fully integrated in the medical record, at least all of the non-reference nucleotide sites, which is about five million. That's not a great deal of information. Um, and have it be dynamically searchable. So I just want to pick up on, on this thread because uh, a lot of the discussion about deep phenotyping um, is implied from what uh, Mike said and others is that it's all in the EHR and the ability to do longitudinal capture. But um, I think the, um, the mobile health and digital health platforms are a form of phenotypes. And uh, for the first time, as Stephen was saying, we now can get 24-7 uh, phenotypic information and translate that into uh, velocities and uh, uh, instead of static measures of, of particular, uh, you know, well um, validated at least uh, forms of that phenotype. So in anticipating where the precision medicine seems to be going, uh, it might behoove NHGRI to really think about um, expanding the kind, kind of integration of genomic information with the e EHR. 
um, and doing something similar with genomic information and uh, digital or mobile health technologies. Just, Other? Just quickly to add, and just very, and we all, we all throw around this concept, it's in the EHR. I mean, there is no the EHR, really. Any, any, because our records, you think about where our records are, they're in our doctor's EHR, our specialist EHR, the hospital we went to in Florida's EHR when we broke our arm, the one we usually go to, CVS, Walgreens, National Death Index, you know, our, our claims data files, um, it's the exposome is the particulate matter that we get from, you know, the, uh, the, the meteorologist. So, I mean, the data is, is everywhere and, and sometimes not so so easy to, to totally integrate. And that was the fragmentation I was referring to, really, in our discussion. But that's why we need personally controlled health records, right? So that the, the individual has all of those data and is able to share those data. I don't even know how to do that. I mean, I can't, I, I couldn't share, think of my financial data. How, how could, I own all of my credit card, everything, and I share it with people? I mean, I just wouldn't know how to do that. I don't know what that means. We own all of our data. I know we all want it to be able to be seen around. I, mean, I don't want all of my healthcare data. Um, I, I wouldn't know what to do with it. I just don't know what it means we own it. I, 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 I've heard that over and over again. We should all own our data. I, I want a few pizza. I want the cholesterol level when I want to go to the lab. Or I want to be able to schedule an appointment. And I want Dr. A to know what, what was in my record from five years ago. Plus, that, does, that model doesn't work for children, for old people, for people who are blind, for people who speak not English as their language. It's, it's not fair to the most vulnerable parts of our community that need us to figure out how to do this. I mean, it's great for patients to be able to take control of what they can, but I don't think we should depend upon that as a way to deliver health care. Just thinking that, um, well, I, I feel that it's very beneficial to retain the sequence data in some form, but if we're talking about data that has not been validated in a CLIA-approved lab and putting it in the EHR, I'm not trying to speak for any federal agencies, but I think there may be some uh, pushback from the FDA uh, in doing that, so just a, something to keep in mind. Well, I think that raises the whole broad question of what sort of the regulatory pieces that surround this, and, and um, you know, one of the problems with the AHRs, at least as most institutions work with them, is there are also are legal documents that are subpoenaable in case there's a concern about a mistake being made. So I think we do, you know, there is something that's a legally defined EHR as opposed to sort of a collection of health data that may be unrelated. Uh, was, Sharon, did you or? Well, I, I was just going to echo that even if it was done in a CLIA lab, right now, EHR, I actually did literally have this circumstance where a patient like approached me with a hard drive from some test they had, had done. Like if I walk up to my EHR and say, like here, like, I mean, um, <laughs> there is no location, but I did just want to echo the other comment, which is that I, I think we, some people really do want to own all their data. Most people just want good health care. Um, and, and, and I think that there are lots of people who don't have the capability to own their own BAM file. And, and I, do, I, I do think that EHRs right now are pretty overwhelmed just with this. And just to give one anecdote, uh, my brother was diagnosed with a brain tumor. I, his uh, wife asked for an MRI and she really pushed them. I want it now. So they actually gave her like four DVDs because it turned out it was like some very early pre-processed state. And she gave it to her brother-in-law who was a radiologist who was like, I don't know what this is. I mean, I don't think we realize how much processing is done on all of our medicine. So when we say we're getting our MRI, we're getting a very processed certified version of it and not like the raw data. So I think that sort of, we, we've, we've sort of seen the com broad complexity of all of these information things related to what's the fundamental definition of phenotype uh, all the way through some of these broader questions, but maybe to sort of bring it back to where Howard asked us to start with is what might be research projects that um, NHGR might think about. So just to throw out a few and see people's reactions to that. 
Um, you know, one of the ones was, you know, how do we improve uh, phenotype and genotype sharing? I feel like we're really well along the way to, with things like ClinGen and ClinVar, to think about sharing of genotypes. I think we're a long way from the sharing of phenotypes, and um, you know, and I'm guilty for the projects I'm involved with. Most of the time, you put all the genotypes up, but you put the one phenotype up that caused the genotypes to be put up there. And I, I can go on, and I won't, uh, at some length about why it is that we do that, but I think it's an area that's worth some discussion. Related to that, I just wanted to say another area where NHGR might be interested that's come up again earlier is this interface between what the meaning of phenotype is uh, informed by humans, but also informed by a variety of model organisms. And so there's been, and Carol could certainly speak to this, but there's been a lot of activity in the last couple of years in the model organism community to think fundamentally about what the meaning of phenotype is, uh, you know, the human phenotype ontology that uh, we heard about earlier is a good example of some of the principles that were actually learned in model organisms being applied to and human monarch, phenotypes. And the monarch system. Right. Yeah, so, cool. you know, to think about there might be research opportunities there for bringing together the model organism community, things like HPO and monarch, uh, together with the, you know, Caesar and Emerge, and to think about how to better capture this phenotype. So I think some focus on phenotype seems to me uh, a really great opportunity. I'll mention three more and then open it up for other people's thoughts, but, you know, this whole idea of portable phenotyping algorithms, I think is, you know, there's been some work on that done in Emerge. I think there's intention for more work to be done in Emerge, but I think uh, to think about maybe how we do that across Ignite and Caesar and some of the other uh, activities in terms of phenotype would go a long way. Clinical decision support, I think the opportunity for uh, thinking about sharing of at least decision support rules. Uh, again, there's, I think, some movement in that direction uh, th that came out of GM7, which was uh, one of these genomic medicine. But again, to think about how NHGRI could create some research around uh, how do we better share clinical decision support rules and what do those look like. And then uh, related to that, I think, is uh, the info button project that we've heard so much about InfoButton is a great infrastructure to be able to collect data outside the EHR with data inside the EHR. But one of the things we need, I think, a lot more of is what that educational material outside the EHR looks like that informs, you know, physicians and even patients about what genetic variation means and what some of these conditions mean uh, might be another area for us. And again, there's been some discussion about that in NHGRI space uh, related to um, the ISCC, ISSC, ISCC, ISCC. Um, and then, um, and I'm not going to remember the name of it, but the project, we, there is a genomics information education page that's maintained, G2C2, G2C2. Right. talk about uh, acronyms, uh, so, they all you know, have G's and C's yes, in I think all of those are things that I would put on the table as uh, lessons from the discussions here that we should talk about, so Mark and then Chris. Yeah, just uh, 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 kind of rank ordering those a bit. Um, thanks for mentioning the Info Button Project. That's something that in ClinGen we're actually looking at and uh, talked to uh, Wendy earlier. Um, a lot of the resources in uh, genetics for patients and providers in that right now are not Info Button accessible and certainly not Info Button compliant. And we actually have a plan in place uh, to work with groups like NCBI and others to make their resources info button accessible so that at least those systems that wish to link their electronic health record to those data sources, uh, they'll be able to do that through that info button standard, which all certified EHRs will need to be able to um, do as part of Meaningful Use 3. Um, the clinical decision support interoperability uh, is a um, is a much harder issue than it um, probably should um, uh, should be, unfortunately, but I, I, I think some of you have heard me say that in uh, HRQ funded seven years of a clinical decision support consortium, and at the end of that, they were able to share one rule between two institutions. And so that interoperability piece is really, they learned a heck of a lot. 
Um, but, um, but the reality is it's very difficult. But uh, at least at a very low bar in eMERGE, um, we're creating and we'll have live by the end of this month a clinical de uh, decision support rule repository where at least we'll have um, the written logic or a visual logic of how a decision support rule might be filed. And a number of the eMERGE groups are contributing to that so people can at least see the logic pattern and then they'll have to go and try and code it. Um, and so it's not interoperable plug and play, but we're at least making some projects. But that would be an area where I think there could be a lot of energy and time and resources invested with probably very little payback because of the, just the challenges in the EHR space with clinical decision support at present. Uh, it's, I'm obviously going to pick up on your phenotyping theme, but I think the community, and not just NHGRI, has been very casual about the entire phenotyping exercise. It's time to start treating clinical information and phenotype algorithms as a first-rank resource. It's an interesting question of whether NHGRI can and should do it in and of itself, because quite frankly, the last thing we'd like to see is an NHGRI style of phenotyping and an NCI style of phenotyping and so on and so forth. I mean, you get the picture. There's no reason why um, NHGRI could not take the lead in coordinating a really a, 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 an OD level project or a common fund project or whatever it might be. Uh, but it's, I think phenotyping has reached a tipping point where it is now the most soft and vulnerable part of the whole scientific enterprise as we try to learn association disease outcome and improve health. Um, I'm pleased that IOM is doing this in partnership with the usual suspects on the clinical side. That's delightful. Uh, and so maybe, you know, extending that kind of collaboration and consortium to a true NIH-wide effort to uh, engage in consistent phenotyping or 